My text today is coming from Acts, the 18th chapter. It's supposed to be verses 1 through 8, and I told Wayne I was going to go all the way through the rest of, you know, all the way through verse 11, because I didn't know that anybody else had verses 9 through 11 uh, assigned to them. So we're going to go all the way through there and talk about that today as we go, because what we're going to be talking about, building up our strength through evangelism. That's what we're going to really be talking about today. We, you know, I know my assignment is about the Corinthians, and, and the conversions of the Corinthians. And that's what we're going to go through that also. But you know, a lot of times we forget what was going on ahead of time. And I always remind myself, you know, I, when I get up to speak, Joshua was told to be what, Hank? Be strong and courageous. And you know, sometimes you think these preachers are, they're up there and nothing bothers them at all. You know, for the last hour and a half, my stomach has been just going like this because I'm thinking, oh no, I'm next, I'm next, I'm next. And I hope we get through this. Be strong and courageous. We want to talk about that as we look at those information that's before us in Acts 8, chapter 18. And I was hoping that, Rick, you'd go ahead and do 18 while you, you were got, you know, almost right there. And I'm thinking, come on, Rick, you can do it. And I can just go up there and say, whatever Rick said, amen. You know, and I can sit back down. But I want to give some historical events that were taking place here. We have the Jews starting a riot basically going on in Rome. And so Claudius, around the years of 45 to, uh, to 54 AD, the fourth Roman emperor, we have him saying, hey, you know what? Get these people out of here. I don't want them here anymore. Send them back home. I don't care what you do with them. I just don't want them in Rome anymore. And so this explosion of the Jewish people, uh, we see this happening. And amongst them was a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And they natives upon us who were tent makers in trade. And they moved to the city of Corinth. And so that's going to bring us up to where we're at, because at the same time, we have Paul and, and Rick said, they're on their first missionary journey. Well, guess where they're at now? They're on their second missionary journey is beginning here. And so at the same time, and so we have Silas, and we're going to have Timothy, and we're going to have Luke here in, in the second missionary journey that's going on. They had been preaching in Greece. They would established congregations in areas in Philippi and Thessalonica, and they'd visited Berea. And then Paul went into Athens alone, and he had an opportunity presented to him, you know, to teach about the Word of God, about this unknown God that you have here. I'm going to talk to you about him because he is the true and the living God. And he walked around at that town and talked to them and encourage them to become Christians. And afterwards, we see him walking about some 50 miles and arrived in a pagan city called Corinth. You know, we would, so, so much of us, uh, many of us would look and say, well, if we're going to take about a, a, a city that is bad, you know, that's a pagan city, we say, Vegas, right? Well, Randy Mabe's not here, so I can say, yeah, Vegas, you know. But we can take a look about any town anymore, can't we? And say, oh, it's a pagan town. We can take a look at him and say, we need to really work with the people that are here. But he's, he'd been west, he went to west uh, and arrived in the pagan city of Corinth, and the others are going to be joining him. And Corinth was a seaport city. You know, it was a very important city. It was the southern tip of Greece. It had a population of probably a half a million people at that particular time. And from every walk of life that you could think of, but it was a cradle of also of pleasures and a show place of architectural beauty. You, you could take a look at and even some of the things that are still left over there. You can take a look and see how in the world did they put this together and how long it stood. I always find it interesting when you take a look at some of that stuff that stood for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And we take a look at buildings, we go tear it down after 30 or 40 years because it's, you know, and it's about ready to fall down. I'm thinking we need to go back and figure out how they did that to make them stand so long. But every time, as you look at the city of Corinth, it was not the city that you'd say, hey, I want to send my kids there to college. It was one of those cities you'd say, hey, I want to stay away from. Because there they had a thousand priests and priestesses who were, really, were basically religious prostitutes there. And they were attached to the temple. And every evening, what they, would they do? They'd go out and they'd look for those people and those who would worship the goddess of love. And the town had such a bad reputation but guess what? If you were really bad, they say, oh, he's just like that Corinthian. He's a Corinthian. He's just, wait, just look the way he, he acts and all, everything he's involved in. 
And we say, you know, if you think of Paul, do you think of him as being bold? Don't you think of him as being strong and powerful all the time? Yet we look at him and we're going to find out that he suffered just as we do uh, from apprehensions, from forebodings, from fears. We look at him and say, wow, Paul, I thought you were really strong, you were unmovable. But you find out that Paul had some apprehensions at times. In fact, and when he wrote to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and there in verse number three, he said, I was with you in weakness and fear. And you'd almost see his knees trim, you know, knocking back and forth. He says, and in trembling. That's where Paul was. He wasn't that strong man every time we see him. He was very much in fear of what could happen to him in this particular city. Open up your Bibles. If you aren't there yet, Rick, you've moved the Bible the way up there. They should still be there. Acts chapter 18, let's read right through uh, those verses assigned to me. It says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, found a certain new Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come to Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and he came unto them. And because he was of the same craft or the same trade, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, and the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And the many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. We hope to find some strength in the passages that we just read. Strength that everyone who is a Christian needs. Anyone who tells you, oh, I'm just fine all the time, that I'm just not ever weak, you need to probably need to take them aside and talk to them. You're going to find that they are weak in some, some point. There's a place that they're saying, I wish I could do that, I want to do that, but I just haven't got started. He was much in fear of what could happen in this particular place. And think about the faith that he had. But think about the faith that we need to have. We need to have the faith. We need to have that strength that we lack. You know, if you, we don't admit that we lack faith, do we? Oh no, we aren't going to admit that I'm lacking faith. Brethren, if there's, a time, if there's a time in your life that you don't lack faith, I don't know what you're not doing because it's going to happen it's going to be happening it's going to like when preachers move it's like it's almost starting all over again isn't it we need to seek out close friends that's what we need to do when we turn down that path that takes us from the straight and narrow and we say well I'm just about ready to give it up and I've heard that from many preachers saying I was just about ready to give it up. You know, I come home every day. Okay, it's time to move. It's time to move. We need our friends to help us out. There in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, again, we have Aquila and Priscilla coming on. Jewish believers who left Rome because of what Claudius had said, get them out of here. But they shared a trade with Paul, and so he was able to go in there and go tent making with him. And all the Jewish males, as you look at that, we had a job training program basically by the age of 13 and Aquila and Priscilla are spoken highly of think about that in every scripture you hear about Aquila and Priscilla they're spoken of very highly and then you have Silas and Timothy coming on the scene they were co-workers with him fellow workers with him and we see that they were there with him in this missionary journey men who had already proven faithful and to the cause of Christ. And they were Paul's friends. And why is that important? It's important because you need someone to lean on. 
someone that can lift you up. Remember when they were going across the Red, Red Sea? They said, go up there and help him. Hold his arms out. He needed his friends. We need our friends. Strong Christian friends are necessary for strength and for support. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the phone with other brethren. Being encouraged. Hang in there. Do this. Do that. Don't do this. You know, a friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson made this statement. He said, a friend is someone who will make us do what we can when we say we can't. And that's what a brother in Christ and a sister in Christ are going to tell you. John, when you can't, don't say I can't. You can. Because the scriptures say that I can do all things for Christ who strengthens me. We need to remind ourselves a Christian brother and a Christian sister is going to help encourage us. It's going to help and strengthen us. Strong Christian friends are necessary also for accountability. Why aren't you doing what you're supposed to be doing, John? You say you want to do this. You go other places and do this. Why aren't you doing it at home, John? You see, we need somebody to do that, don't we? We need somebody to say, oh, yes, I can go somewhere else. Why am I not doing it at home? Strong Christians are there. And proverb writers in the 27th proverb in verse number 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted. You know, sometimes you need that friend to just come up to you and say, okay, it's time to wake up call. It's a wake up call to get you back on track where you need to be. Accountability. Why aren't you doing, you know, you have somebody to help watch what I'm doing, why I'm doing, and how I'm doing. We have to be out there. When we should say, we... When you take a look at Luke's writings in the book of Acts, you see that we, and we can do more than me. We can do more together than by ourselves. And so we need to reach out to those people. We need people to reach out to us and help us and encourage us and to strengthen us. We need to remind ourselves that we can't do it alone, but we can do it with God's help. We can do it with our brothers and sisters' help. We need to seek out some opportunities to tell others about Jesus. I heard someone saying, well, I know this one brother or sister, they need to just walk up to anybody and start, start talking to them about Jesus. I can't do that. You know why you can't do that? Because you haven't tried it, usually. You haven't tried it. You suppose that person just automatically just started talking to someone? We need to seek out those people who can help us to encourage us and to strengthen us. You know, even though the Apostle Paul was afraid of what could happen in Corinth, he was faithful in taking the opportunity to share the gospel with others. You know, when you go out there and you do that, I remember the first time Trent and I did that. Trent was, might have been in grade school still, I think, Trent, when we went to Virginia, Minnesota. He's out there knocking doors, and we're still knocking doors. If we're not, we should be. Some people say it doesn't, doesn't work anymore. When's the last time you tried it? Acts 18, chapter and verse number 4. Let's go there again. There it says, and he reasoned with, here's Paul. He says, that he, here's the opportunity. He says, he reasoned with them in the synagogues every Sabbath, persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. He took advantage of it. He, he had work to do. He was out there being a tent maker. Well, I can relate with Paul. You know, for 27 years, I worked for the post office and did the preaching. And then went to India, went to Estonia. Uh, you know, we can do things if we really want to put our, set our minds to it. Here's Paul says, you know, I put in a long day making tents, and then what are you going to do with your spare time? I'm, I can take a look at uh, Charles Coates. And I'd look at him, an example, and a friend of mine, and think about, you know, he'd get up in the morning, he'd go to work. I'm putting in a 10, 12 hour day of work. Then he'd come home and he'd get on the computer and he'd be teaching online, preparing for his sermons, preparing for his lessons. We need to be about the Father's business. Paul didn't stop when the Jews became obstinate and just didn't want anything to do with him. You know, he didn't say, well, that's it, I'm done. You know, he, he went out there, and he's out there in verse number 6, and when they opposed themselves, blasphemed, he shook off his raiment, 
and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am cleansed. I'm clean from henceforth. I will go into the Gentiles. He didn't just say, you know what? I'm going to take off my jacket and hang it up. I'm done. I'm just going to be a tent maker and nothing else. He didn't. What did he do? Like we do when we door, go door knocking. Went to the next door. And what did he find? He went to the next door, verses 7 and 8. Let's take a look at what it says. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord, and with all his house and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Paul didn't stop. He didn't just say, I'm done. I'm, somebody else can do this. He went next door to the synagogue. He began to teach from there. The very next place. That's, you know, that's what I love about some of the foreign work. You knock on a door if you have a door to knock on. And if somebody doesn't want to study on this door, you go to the next door, there's probably going to be a study. Wayne's found this out quite often as we go to different places. It's like, there's another door. We'll just keep on knocking those doors until we find someone who has a willing heart. The Greek text, when we think about this, he went right next door. And the Greek text indicates that Justice House was right there, shared a common wall with the synagogue. It wasn't like he, you know, had a hundred yards in between the two places. And it, it reminds me of places in India. I, I remember a few years ago, it's been, I've been going to India for I don't know how many years now, 20 some years. And here's this motel, fancy motel. And right on the outside of their wall, here's somebody else has decided to build their little house right there. I mean, it's just a hut. Lean-to, we would call them. Well, that's kind of what we have here. Right on that wall, here's another house. They shared that common wall. So many times when we go out, we say, I can't go door knocking. I can't go talk to someone about Jesus. Because I don't know everything I need to know about it. Well, guess what? Nobody does. Hank, did you know it the first time you went out to talk to someone about Jesus? No, it's just, you've got to do it over and over and over again. We have to be steadfast and immovable. We need to go out there and we need to do the work. We don't have to have it all together. You know, if the apostles and the early evangelists waited till they had it all together before they told some about, about Jesus, we wouldn't even be here today. You know, so many say, well, I've only, I've only been a Christian for a year or so. Well, guess what? That's the best time to go out and tell somebody. When you're a brand new Christian, you're on fire. And yet I've seen so many people that's on fire that someone who's been a Christian for 20 years takes them aside and says, slow down, you're going too fast. You've probably seen that, Tony. And what happens? They lose all their evangelistic efforts right there. The door just all of a sudden slams shut. If somebody told them they're going about it too fast. The church today, the statement has been made, the church today is raising a generation of mules. They know how to sweat and work, but they don't know how to reproduce. And brethren, that's what we need to be doing. We need to rep be reproducing Christians. That's our job. That is what we're living for in this kingdom, is to re reproduce other Christians. Go out and tell them how to do it so they can tell someone else how to do it. And all the way down the line, we have to make sure that next generation is there. One of the greatest things about telling others about Jesus is that it gets easier and easier and easier every time you do it. I can't do it? Well, guess what? you got to start. I remember the first time I ever presented a lesson and Caleb, you can probably relate to this, all right? I had six pages, front and back, completely filled out. 
And six minutes later, I was done. Now people get worried. Well, who was it that got up here? Oh, it was Jack McNeil, wasn't it? He said, Ed, no, I don't. Who? It was somebody that already spoke. And they said, I got three pages. And people get worried. People get worried if you have more than a page worth of notes now, don't they? But think about that. Six minutes, six pages. You know, I could read that so fast. I was a speed reader, and I could speak almost as fast as Mornay can. <laughs> he's, he's a speed talker. Think about this. The more you do it, the easier and easier it gets. The more you do it, I'll guarantee you, the more you'll want to do it. You say, why aren't we doing it? I, I, get, uh, I get a chuckle out of our friend Lois, her sister Lois. Let's go out, knock some doors. And, and I loved the, the statement said earlier today. Let's have a cookout here on Saturday night so we'll make sure we're going to be here on time on Sunday morning. A tailgate party, I guess what to call them. I've never been to one of those personally. Uh, can you imagine if we said, hey, we're going to meet in the parking lot and we're going to spend the night in the parking lot so we don't... How many people would show up for that? But for a football game that's 40 degrees below zero, you'll have 50,000 people show up. You see, our priorities, we say, our priorities aren't that bad. Well, they get that way, don't they? Oh, I'm not feeling really good today, so I better not go to services. Tomorrow you feel a little bit worse, but you know what? You go to work, which is more important. We need to be with the brethren. We need to be meeting them. We need to be there to help each other. We need to be there and certainly encourage one another to be about the work. You know, sometimes just being there to help somebody else teach is all we need to do is just be there, just to be sitting there. Again, that's where strength comes, where two or three of us come together and we go out and work. We have to be doing that continually. We need to seek out some place that teaches the Word of God. You know, it used to be, when I, I, I'm fortunate, and I'll be honest with you, I'm very fortunate. You know, I don't know any religion other than the Lord's Church, basically. I mean, I had... I've, I've attended Baptist church, I've attended the Christian church, but, you know, I, I was young. And by the time, you know, I was about the fourth, fifth grade, I've never attended any denomination. And I look back and think, how blessed I am. I look at my great-grandparents, members of the church, on my dad's side. My, my grandparents, my parents. See, I'm blessed. I, I'm guessing that most of you can't say that about your lineage. Many of you come out of denominations, as, as we heard this morning. Dudley was talking, Dudley and Teresa. Many have done that. I've been privileged. I'm one of the privileged few. We need to continue to continue to look at Paul and say, you know what, Paul, I know you were nervous, you were scared at times, but you became bold. When he prays, give me boldness. I don't, you know, I, I get nervous when somebody says, well, I'm afraid of offending somebody. Brethren, we, don't, we need to stop worrying about offending somebody with the Word of God. It's not us offending them, it's the Word of God that's offending them. As Brother Clint pointed out in his lesson earlier, he talked about, you know, it, 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 it's coming into the church, that, oh, well, you're spending too much time talking about everything but the man. And they mean, you know, you're, you're talking about everything but the man. You need, and, and Clint brought out so many things. You cannot talk about the man, Jesus, without talking about these other things. He mentioned it very clearly. You can't talk about the plan without talking about the man, Jesus. You cannot talk about the man, Jesus, without talking about the church and his kingdom and what we are supposed to be out doing. So many times we get stuck on Acts 
And we tell everybody, repent and be baptized, but we don't tell them anything else. We stop right there. We get somebody, and I'm having a very good Bible study right now back home. But if this prospect becomes a Christian, I don't expect to just stop and leave him once he becomes a Christian. We need to grow him so he can go out and teach others. That's what we need to be doing. We need to preach the plan of salvation, but we then need to be preaching about we need to go. You know, another one was said, go ye means go me. As preachers of the word of God, we're responsible for declaring the whole counsel of God, not just part of it. We need to declare the whole counsel. We, oh, well, if I speak on this, this brother, you know, they're living in a, a marriage they shouldn't be in, and it might offend them, they might just stop coming. Well, they might just repent and get out of that. Brother, we need to address those things, not be worried about them. We need to preach the whole counsel because it is very powerful. The Hebrew writer in the fourth chapter, verse 12, said, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's how sharp the word of God is. Isaiah said it this way in the 55th chapter in verses 10 and 11. It says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. The word of God. That's what we're out there teaching. We're not taking some gimmick that's going to change every 24 hours or every, you know. God bless the brethren that come up with a different plan. Oh, can I get people to listen to me? There's only one plan, and it's in the book. It's right here. It's there. We don't have to have this special plan. Oh, this plan's working. That plan's working. This plan... This plan has never stopped. The only thing stopped is us doing it. We need to always remind ourselves that years ago when I was growing up, back in the 50s, that dates me real fast, doesn't it? You know, brethren were known as people of the book. And I told you, I mentioned my great-grandfather and I remember one time, I don't know what it was all about, but the story was told. It was this person said, well, if we don't have a Bible, you know, they were talking about going to court, and they don't have a Bible, I'll just put my hand on, you know what they said? My great-grandfather, because he knows the book. And I'd be just like saying, that's the Bible, because that's how well he knew it. And we say that today. If somebody said, well, we don't have a Bible, of course, now they're probably throwing their Bible out. Would they be able to do that? So I'll just put my hand on this brother because he knows the Bible. Clear appeal to Scripture and not human doctrine reasoning was distinctive in the early church. You know, we must always remain a people of the book. We need to be that distinctive person. You know, when they say, well, you guys are so different. than That's what we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be like denominations. We are to be different from them. Instead of looking and seeing what the denominations are doing to grow, we need to say, why aren't we growing? Because probably it's because it's far not growing because we're not doing what the scriptures tell us to do. We just stopped. We're just comfortable where we are. We need to be like the noble Bereans. We need to search the scriptures, make sure what is preached, what is taught, what is done is according to the word of God. We need to hold each other accountable. The elders need to hold the congregation accountable. But we as individual Christians need to hold each other accountable. 
We see someone who's not been here for three weeks. Why not? Let's go knock on that door. We don't have to leave that up to the elders. We don't have to leave that up to the preacher. But we always have to follow scriptural teachings. And we need to apply it to ourselves before we can apply it to other ones. We, can't, we can change the methodologies that I mentioned just a few moments ago, but the message never changes. The message never changes. And we need to seek out some answers from God. First, you have to develop relationships, of course, but God has already told us He wants to develop relationships in order to bring others into the fold. Don't work alone if you don't have to. Now, sometimes you have to go out to an area and start it all by yourself. But it's better when you go out. You know, God sent them out two by two. Jesus sent out his disciples. Why? You can count on each other. You can count on each other. Find someone to work with. You may not like it, but do it. You'll be if you know. You might be miserable. You know. Have you ever worked with somebody and you say, "Oh, I wish I, I. How did I ever get stuck with this person?" That's you know. That's kind of like they used to be with me with with ball games. You know. John, go out and play right field. You know who's always putting right field, don't you, Hank? Worst player you got in the whole team. Well, I was able, I, every once in a while I moved to another position. You know, after I got out of bat boy position, that's the one I was at to begin with. We have to train. We need to get with others, people, that's going to be like-minded. We need to respond to that fear and put faith where that fear is. God encouraged and strengthened Paul for the job he wanted him to do. Look at there, Acts 18, chapter, verses 9 through 11. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Remember, there's no church established here. He said, but be not afraid to speak and hold thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there in a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. He says, I know you're afraid, Paul, but keep on going. He says, because you'll remain faithful to what I'm asking you to do because there's a great number of people who are going to respond to the gospel plan of salvation. Sometimes we give up too easily. We get discouraged. We get worried. We get upset. We get downhearted. We think our efforts are for nothing. But God uses this passage like here we have right before us this morning. This afternoon, I guess it is, isn't it? He uses this passages here to remind us we don't have to work alone because he's there for us. He's there with us. God sees his solutions. We so often only see the problems. God's got all the solutions. Paul received his strength from God. He was able to stay in Corinth for a year and a half just to teach the church there. We need to seek out some ways to strengthen others. You know, you'll never get as strong as you can until you've helped someone else get strong in the Lord. Over in the Hebrews letter, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 14, he says, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern. We need to be discerning people. We are called to encourage. We are called to edify one another. Paul spent a lot of his time working and teaching with others. In all of his letters, Paul mentions those whom he is working with to help accomplish the efforts in the kingdom. He had notable people working with him. Aquila, Priscilla, he had Silas, he had Timothy, he had Luke. You know, Paul was always working to strengthen other people, but you know what? They were strengthening him at the same time. And I'm going to mention some names right here, right now. I, I told Leanne I was going to call out some names. I remember, and I'll get emotional. Jim and Judy. I 
I shouldn't have mentioned names. I was Coates. One of the first lectures I came to, Charles said, come on over and sit with me, because I, I didn't know hardly anybody. Charles took me in. Ted Thrasher, Chuck, Jack Williams, Wayne Burr. Leanna. People who have helped strengthen me, to encourage me. People that have helped build and grow my faith. Brethren, that's what we need to be doing. Building and growing each other's faith so that we can be about the work. God has provided ways to build our strength. And one of those ways is becoming more evangelistic in our efforts. Like physical strength, we have to do it over and over and over again. I was off, out of practice lifting weights. I was out of practice doing this. And how did I get better? By lifting more weights, by bicycling more. I remember the first time I started bicycling, and Leanna knows about my bicycling efforts. First time I went, and I went about a mile and a half, I thought I was going to die. Well, you know, I almost died one year when I went to India. But I, what's interesting with that, I went out and rode my bicycle for 10 miles the day before I went to India. The day, day after that, I had my heart attack. But you know what? When I came back, I started riding a bicycle again. That's the same way with what we're doing spiritually. We need to exercise. We need to go out there and do it instead of letting somebody else. Because the Bible assures us that we can build our spiritual strength if we just open up our hearts and our Bibles of what God can do through us. Because we are just His clay. And we're out there doing His work. Turn with me to Ephesians 1st chapter, verses 18 through 21. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of this calling, what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own place in his right hand in heavenly places. God promises us. He says, don't fear. Fear not. Isaiah the 41st chapter, verse number 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isn't it time to trust God? And isn't it time to be obedient to him and go and preach the word and teach all nations. Thank you.